Well, good morning and a welcome to Cross Community Church. I'm really excited today because we are beginning a new series called The Five Solas. Now, uh, the five solas are basically some marks or some distinctives that are the foundation of what we know as the Protestant Reformation. So if you want to know uh, why we believe the things that we believe, why we do the way we do uh, as a church, the decisions that we make, um, a lot of it is rooted in these five solas, which are all rooted in Scripture. Um, but I want you to imagine this as we begin today. I want you to imagine um, growing up and not having a Bible. Uh, imagine growing up and not believing that you can pray and have a direct relationship with God. Imagine growing up believing that you were not able to receive communion, that you couldn't even ask for forgiveness on your own. But instead, imagine that everything you wanted to do with God, you had to work through an intermediary, somebody else, a priestly class of person um, that had to do things on your behalf. So if you wanted uh, forgiveness for sins, you had to go to confession. And rather than receiving communion in yourself, it would only be the priest that would receive communion or partake in communion. Imagine if only the priestly class had the scriptures and they just told you what they meant. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years throughout Christianity, this was the case. If you know much about the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm not trying to disparage them here, um, they were the only church of the day. Uh, the Bible was only printed in Latin, unless you could read the original Hebrew or Greek. And so common people had no access to the Word of God. If you wanted to know what the Bible said, you had to go and ask somebody who was deemed closer to God or more capable or more qualified uh, than you would have been. So common people, they did not have the Word of God. And if you knew, know what kind of happened in the Middle Ages, the, the Catholic Church began to teach the, a couple of doctrines that really made things difficult for people. The first was that of purgatory. Anyone ever heard of purgatory? You're not going to read about it in the Bible, uh, but it was one of these doctrines. Now, to be really clear, I do not believe these doctrines actually arose from the church as, as Jesus intended. Uh, if you know much about throughout history, the Catholic Church kind of got intertwined in politics and power, and there was a lot of things done to kind of control by people who probably weren't even Christians, but they did it in the name of the church if they could uh, get power doing so. So purgatory, was, the idea of purgatory was this. Everything you've ever done wrong in your life, and you better think back, that list is probably long, right? When you die, you're going to go to a holding place. Not heaven, not hell yet, but you're going to go to a holding place where you are going to be punished for every sin you've ever committed. And then once all those sins have been thoroughly punished, it is only then that you can go to heaven and be with Jesus. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but just knowing the list of my sins, like you just take like a 10-year period of my life and I'm going to spend a lot of time in purgatory, right? I, and nobody wanted to do that. So then there arose a new doctrine, and you've probably heard of this as well. It was a doctrine of indulgences. So here's how this would go down. If you wanted to shorten your sentence, if you will, if you wanted to maybe kind of cut down the time you would spend in purgatory, you could do penance or, or receive these indulgences from the church. It would have to be your priest or your pastor or the pope or someone. Um, and they would give you indulgences. We're kind of like shorten your sentence, I guess, or maybe reduced sentence for what you had done. Now, you would have to pray certain prayers. If you've ever heard someone do Hail Marys, that's what this is. Um, so that was a part of an indulgence. Or you could visit certain holy sites like dead people's graves or, or whatever. You could go to the Vatican, and, and that would give you an indulgence. And another really important way for the church is you could give some money. As a matter of fact, during the reign of Pope Leo X, you can go back and, and research this in your history textbooks. During the reign of Pope Leo X, paying for indulgences, it really, really grew. Now, people didn't have the word. They didn't know the Bible. They, they didn't speak Latin. They couldn't have read the text. And what the church was telling them is, hey, you can't just, we won't just give indulgences to get you out of purgatory quicker. We're going to do an indulgence that's kind of a once for all. If you will pay us a certain sum of money, it'll just clear you out of purgatory completely. It'll just save you. As a matter of fact, you can get indulgences for your deceased relatives. So if you'll just save enough money, then grandma doesn't have to spend time in purgatory. And it was really, really effective. If you've ever been to St. Peter's Basilica or heard like the Vatican in Rome, um, all of that was built during this time. 
using the money that people gave, trying to buy their way out of purgatory or pay their way into heaven. It was a terrible time of abuse and oppression by men who were, again, political figures who wanted to remain in power. And then along came a monk. He was a Catholic priest. He'd studied um, as Catholic priests study. He'd spent time in a monastery, and he began to read the Psalms. He had to ask for permission because you didn't study that in their seminaries, if you will. And then he began to study other books of the Bible. And the more that he studied the Scriptures, the more he became convinced that there was a really big gap between what these political church leaders were teaching and what the Bible actually said. In just a few days, we're going to celebrate, I think it's the 501st anniversary from the date that Martin Luther drafted his 95 theses and posted them on the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. And in those theses, he took the Pope to task for selling of indulgences. He's like, where do you find that in the Bible? And he began to take the church to task on a lot of teachings that simply were not biblical. And at the core of Martin Luther's understanding, at the core of all that he did that ushered in the area that we're sitting here doing things the way we do things today, was the the first doctrine we're going to talk about in this Five Solas series. It was the doctrine of Sola Scriptura. What he posited was that no pope and no council and no priest should tell us what to believe, but instead we should allow the Scripture alone, that's sola scriptura, the Scriptures alone should be our authority to teach us about life and faith and practice. And that really we don't need popes and cardinals and bishops or pastors to read us, read the scriptures to us, or to tell us what the Bible means, but instead that every individual can have a relationship with God. You can study the word. You can pray to him. Luther began to give communion to common people, which seems completely normal to us, but would not have been permitted in his day. It was on the doctrine of sola scriptura that scriptures alone are our supreme authority for life and faith and practice, that the Protestant Reformation was ushered in things to begin to change very, very quickly for the church as men and women began to read the Bible for themselves. Now, here's the thing. Martin Luther uh, was not super popular uh, with the church, if you can imagine. They had a a big council kind of convened to condemn him and ask him to recant. He wouldn't do it. And he went out, and when he left this diet of worms, it's called, uh, he began to translate the Bible into German. And when he finished the New Testament, because of the printing press, which came out, um, it sold 5,000 copies in the first two weeks of it being printed. People had a hunger for the Word of God, and as they began to open up the Scriptures and read for themselves what the Word of God had to say, really a revival that we still enjoy the benefits of today began to sweep across Europe. It really carried over into the United States today, and the foundation of all of these solas we're going to look at is that of sola scriptura. Today I want to talk to you about why we do some of the things we do as a church, one of our core beliefs as a church, and and one of the things that undergirds almost everything that we do, and and that has to do with our perspective on Scripture. Now, I was going to give you a lot more history, but that would have taken forever, so I'm just going to jump in today. So why sola scriptura? Why do we believe that the Bible alone is our source of supreme authority for faith and practice? Like, if you come into my office, for example, and something's not going well in your life or your marriage or whatever, the thing that I'm going to do is not going to give you uh, my wisdom Because I don't have very much wisdom, right? I might have some thoughts. I might have some practical ideas for you. But the thing that I want to do is to bring the Scripture to bear on your life. That's because of this core belief that we have of sola scriptura. That Scripture alone is unique in its ability to speak to our lives. So again, I ask the question, why sola scriptura? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And the first idea that we're going to look at today, the first uh, characteristic of Scripture is the one from which everything else flows for us today. So uh, I want you to make sure and focus in on this point, all right? So this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing to his protege, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he's speaking to him about the nature of Scripture. And, And listen to what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, all scripture 
is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, not that any of us would ever need that, right? For correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Now, when you hear the word inspired here, um, we're not talking about like what happens when, you know, you hear like this really awesome story of the guy who was, you know, maybe he, he wasn't much of an athlete and then he began to grow and be strengthened and then he won an Olympic gold medical medal and then you're like, oh, he's my inspiration, right? That's not the usage of the word here. Like the writers of the scriptures were not like inspired by God and his goodness to write what they wrote. Um, this word inspiration means something profoundly different from that. As a matter of fact, if you were to look into the Greek, this is the word theonoustos. It's actually two words kind of sandwiched together. So you have theos, which means God, and you have noustos, where, where we get our, our word pneumonia. It actually means breath. And so what, what Paul is writing to Timothy when he talks to him about Scripture, the thing which makes Scripture different than every other thing that we have here on this earth, is it's literally breathed out by God. Like when we read the Scriptures... We are reading the very words of God. All Scripture is inspired of God. And therefore, because it is from God, inspired by God, that's what makes it profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, so that we might be equipped for every good work. Now, one of the common misconceptions in our culture is, oh, no, 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 those, those guys who wrote it, like Paul, I don't know if you've heard these arguments, but Paul was kind of a chauvinist, and that's why he said the things he said about women. Or, or maybe uh, Peter had these perspectives that weren't right with the Jews, and so they were all kind of bringing their own ideas to bear. But I want to read to you another scripture. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, and I want you to see what the Bible says about itself, all right? He says this, But know this first of all. At the very beginning, when we come to Scripture, as we begin to look into the Word of God, know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. This wasn't the author's like, hey, I want to write down some good thoughts today. And I think I'm going to record some things that will be helpful for the world. No, no, no. These did not come about by an act of the human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. When we look at the scriptures, we open up our Bibles. We're not reading the words of men. We're not reading their interpretation of events. We're not reading just an ordinary book. We are reading the very words of God to his people. Like the God of creation, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the one who spoke all that we know and see into existence. He has given to us the Word of God that we might know Him. We might know like who He is and, and how we should think about Him. And, and, and in particular, how we should relate to God. Like if He's God and I'm not, like how does this work out? What our relationship with God can be like. Why do we care about Sola Scriptura? It's because the Word alone is inspired of God. There's no other book, there's no other place that we're going to get that in all of creation, but in the Word of God itself. The second thing flows from that idea. First of all, so is Scripture because of inspiration. We turn to the Bible alone to regulate our faith and practice and what we do here because it alone is from God. If you want to know why we have elders to be honest with you, I spent my entire life, I grew up in this church, and I, I read the scriptures, and I'm like, what is this about elders? Why don't we have elders in our church? The Bible talks about it. Why don't we do it? Well, guess what? We did it. And if you want to know why we do the things that we do here as a church and believe the things that we believe uh, as much as, as humanly possible, we have striven, I guess, to be rooted in the Word of God because it alone is inspired. Listen, I got some preferences I know what I, I like. There's certain music I like, and some of y'all don't like it. And then, then like, I, I kind of like it to be a little darker in here, or maybe you like it to be a little... We don't, we don't like, get caught up on preferences. We look to the Word of God to tell us who we should be as a people, what the church is supposed to be like, because it alone is inspired. Number two, because God is perfect, and this is really important, because here's the thing. If you're perfect and you make a mistake... You ain't perfect anymore, right? Like you were perfect. That's past tense if you made some sort of mistake. Um, if I were telling you, and I was, this would be probably 
not humble, but regardless, if I were saying, hey, um, I'm a perfect person in all of my ways, and then I told you a lie, I wouldn't be perfect anymore. I would now be a sinful or an errant person. Because God himself is perfect and because he is the author of Scripture, because he breathed out the words of God, he gave them to us, the Word of God is inerrant, which means the Scriptures are without error. Since the Protestant Reformation happened and people began to look at their Bibles to see how they're to relate to God, who God is, and how we should live in this world, there has been this movement to undermine the Scriptures. To cause men and women to question, like, can I really trust that? Is the Bible really true? And I would just say, if the Scriptures are indeed inspired, if they are given to us by a perfect God who breathed them out, then the Scriptures are inerrant, and therefore we can trust them. Even in those areas where they push us in ways that we don't really like. Even... When they would call on us to love people that are hard to love. Respond to people in ways that are not our natural responses. What we do is we look at ourselves and we see our own sinful tendencies, our own weakness of our flesh. And then we look at God and we see his perfection. We're like, God, this is not how I want to respond to my enemy. God, this is not how I want to respond to my political opponent. God, this is not how I want to conduct myself, but because I'm the sinful one and you're the perfect one, I'm going to trust you. And we submit our lives to the inspired and inerrant Word of God. Now, I need to speak a little bit of clarity here. Some people are going to bring up uh, manuscripts. So, you know, um, we have the original writers of the Gospels, of the New Testament letters, Old Testament stuff. Um, they originally wrote, we believe they wrote inerrantly, which means they didn't make any mistakes. However, um, from the first century until we got a printing press, things were hand copied. And so some people will find a copy somewhere where a scribe made a mistake. And they're like, see, you can't trust the Bible. And I'm like, you have a hundred other manuscripts that show you what was correct, all right? So if you were to take all of the various manuscripts throughout history, they're about 99% in agreement with one another. Yes, there are times where a scribe left out a vowel, okay? Or even omitted a whole word. There's a, um, a version of the King James Bible, which if you're a King James lover, just forgive me, I'm sorry. Uh, but it was known as the Dirty Bible because when they were translating and, and getting it all lined out and ready to print um, in, in doing the Ten Commandments, the thou shalt not commit adultery, they left out the word not. It says thou shalt commit adultery. By the way, if you have one of those Bibles, it's worth millions because they're really, really rare and people think it's kind of cool the Bible might say that. Listen, um, the Scriptures themselves are not errant. We, we've made mistakes in terms of our copying, but when you read your Bible, you can read it with confidence that you're reading the Word of God, that this would be His will for your life, that you should live in accordance with His Word and His ways, that He is who the Bible says that He is. And so um, I would just encourage you as you read it, read it with confidence and read it with hope that you're reading the very words of God. All right. So we have the reason we, we stand where we stand on Scripture is because it alone is inspired and it alone is inerrant. But here's a really, really important principle that I want to give to you. The third thing is the principle of clarity. The Scriptures are understandable. Like, I'm really thankful that I get to be your pastor. And I get to stand up here oftentimes, most Sundays, and I, I preach to you. I hope that you're encouraged from the Word of God. But I'm, I'm just going to tell you this on the front end. You don't need me. You don't need our elders. You don't need anyone else. If you have the Holy Spirit of God in your, in your heart and you have the Scriptures, you have everything that you need to understand. Now, listen, people are going to encourage you. Hopefully, you're encouraged through preaching and through your small group and other believers that can you know, like bring verses to bear on specific situations. But you don't need other people. God created, He gave us the Bible in a way that is sufficiently clear for us to understand it. I mean, think about how mean it would be of God to give us commands and expect us to obey them, but commands that we couldn't otherwise understand. Like, that wouldn't be, obviously, that wouldn't be very nice of God. He would cease to be holy and righteous if he did something. He commanded something that we couldn't do and didn't provide a way to do it. So um, the, the scriptures are sufficiently clear that we might understand them. I, I use this illustration in the first service. If you were at our volunteer banquet, <clears throat> 
<clears throat> a few weeks ago, we gave out some staff awards. I really just wanted to make fun of our staff so y'all would have a chance to, to know them. And one of the awards that I gave out was the person who's most likely to say something accidentally hilarious. And that is Julie Bridges. In almost any situation, it doesn't matter what's going on, she is going to say something that's going to make people laugh. We're gonna, we, and we have more fun when Julie is around. Uh, the, the thing that makes her humor distinctive is it's not always intentional. And so that makes it that much more funny. Uh, a few weeks ago, she sent me a text message that said something like this. Hey, Jason, have you found me a man yet? And of course, I'm like, what? Like, should I send this to your husband? You know, what's going on with, it, with this thing? Uh, what Julie was referencing was a prior conversation we'd had where she was like, hey, I need a, a really good guy to serve up in children's ministry that would just be someone who would be really faithful and the boys can have someone to look up to. Do you know of any guys that could do that? I'm like, well, let me think about it and get back to me. So then she sends me the text message, hey, have you found me a man yet? Now, I knew exactly what she intended, and I fully intended to misrepresent that for fun, right? I, I was not going to let her off the, the hook because I got to have fun with it. But here's the thing. Do you know what Julie's message meant? It meant what she intended it to mean. Uh, there's this idea out there with the scriptures. Well, that's just your interpretation. I want to be really clear with you today. There is one correct interpretation of scripture. It's not how you feel about it. It's not how I feel about it. It's not how your grandma viewed it or even your old pastor said it. The scriptures mean what God intended them to me. Now, there's certainly different uh, personal applications for what Scripture means. And so if the Scripture says, love your enemy, it means love your enemy. We may have different enemies. We may struggle with that in varying ways, varying times, but it means love your enemies. Here's the thing. God has made the Scriptures. He's given them to us in such a way that they are sufficiently clear that we can know what the Bible says. And we can live it out. We can interpret it rightly. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, the wise person is the one who hears these words of mine, who looks into the Scripture, reads what the Bible says, and then puts it into practice. That's the person that's building his, his life on the rock, the one who's going to stand the test of time. But there's a fool out there that would hear the words of Jesus, would read the Scriptures, and then not go live it out. That person is foolish. That's the one whose life is going to crumble. Now, again... Jesus' expectation, even of his own words, of his own teaching, is that we would be able to hear or we would be able to read and understand what the Bible has to say. If you're one of those people out there who's intimidated, like, oh, I'm not sure I can understand the word. Listen, you have the Holy Spirit of God. And God, who, if anyone is a perfect communicator, God is. God has made the scriptures where they are knowable and accessible to us that we can read and know. So, three points we've covered. Scriptures are inspired of God, breathed out by Him. Therefore, they are without error. They are inerrant. They are sufficiently clear that we can understand what the Bible says. We can come to know who God is and how we're supposed to relate to Him. Let me just go back to this one more second. You don't need anybody else to tell you what the Bible says. Now, you do have to be kind of humble as you approach the Scriptures. Because you're going to bring your own sinful tendencies and you're going to want to make the Bible say things it doesn't say or not say things that it does say. But you can read the Bible and you can know what it means. Uh, if I ever stood up here and said something that is not in line with the Scriptures, you need to come have a conversation with me, like quickly. Hopefully I'll, I'll admit the mis mistake and correct it. But you don't want to be a part of a church that's going to teach you anything that the Bible doesn't teach you. All right? Fourth thing here, and this is to kind of round it all out, is that of the sufficiency of Scripture. It is inspired, it is inerrant, it is clear, and it is sufficient for us. I want to go back to that 2 Timothy 3 passage for you. Scripture isn't just like knowable, right? It is sufficient for us. I want you to read this again. All Scripture is God-breathed, or it is inspired. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate. This is a Greek word which means complete. May be adequate and equipped for every good work. 
So before the foundations of the earth, God was working. He was planning. He like shaped you and he molded you. The scriptures say he knit you together uh, in your mother's wombs and that he womb. Oh, she only had one. And he prepared good works for you in advance. Do you know how you are so, you know, to be equipped for those good works? It's through the word of God. It says here that you can be complete. All scripture was breathed out that you might be mature, that you might be complete, that you might have everything that you need. Now, oftentimes we have a tendency to want to turn to anything and anything else. Like we're like flipping through the channels and thinking Oprah is going to give us hope, right? Or who's the next like new fad, the next thing that we can read and oh, they seem so wise. The scriptures themselves are sufficient. Now, a little bit of a qualifier here. If you need to repair your vehicle this afternoon, scriptures aren't going to help you much, right? If you need to make a meal, uh, got a new recipe, you're not going to find that in the Word. The scriptures do not even attempt to speak to every issue. They're not a, like a full history uh, of the world. That's not what they are. But everything that you need to know for life and for faith and for religious practice, we find in the Word of God. That doesn't mean you can't read Christian books, but you need to read Christian books that point you back to the Word. That doesn't mean you can't have friends and confidants who would encourage you and counsel you in your life. But that means you need friends and confidants and, pe confidants and people that counsel you according to the Word. Because the Scriptures are sufficient. As a matter of fact, apart from the Scripture, I'll just push on you a little bit. If you are not reading the Scriptures, submitting yourself to the Word of God, spending time in the Word, you're not mature. You're not maturing. You're not going to be complete. I love the things that I preach up here. And I pray they're of extraordinary value to you. But it's not enough. You need the Word of God in your life, spending time with it each and every day where the Word is shaping you and changing you. The Spirit is revealing Himself to you through His Word. If you're not in the Word, you're going to be a little bit like one of those people we, we talked about a few weeks ago. One of those immature children who's blown and tossed by every wind and wave of doctrine, every new idea. Oprah's got a new book. Osteen's got a new thing. And we're, and we're just shifting all the time. But if we have the Word, we have a solid foundation. And we're able to stand up against those storms. So the Word is sufficient and it is necessary in our lives. So I began today, and I talked to you about kind of a, a, a real tragedy Throughout Christianity, and if you are in apologetics at all, people that would argue against the church, if you want to know uh, most of the ammunition that unbelievers would have against the church, they're going to talk about this era of the church, when men and women didn't know the word. It was, it was in Latin, and they couldn't read Latin, right? Mass, even worship services were conducted in Latin. Men and women didn't know the word, and man, there's some really awful things that the church did in the name of Christ, in the name of the word. It's tragic what we see throughout history. Crusades and oppression. But there's another tragedy today. And the tragedy isn't that the word is unavailable. The tragedy is that we're uninterested. As men and women, we've been charged with becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. But we don't look into the word to see what a disciple does to see who a disciple is, what we believe and what we don't believe. We don't look into the Word to see who Jesus was and who He's ultimately called us to be. See, there was a tragedy in medieval times, ancient history, where people had no idea what the Word of God said. They couldn't read it. They Our tragedy today is that we're distracted and we're disinterested. Now, one of the, the foundational things, if you want to be a member of Cross Community Church, the thing that we're going to say, hey, this has got to be central to your life, is that you would devote yourself daily to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. If any man would come after me, he must deny himself daily, take up his cross and follow me. So we say, devote yourselves daily. That means you open up the Word of God, and you spend time with God in His Word, asking Him to reveal Himself to you. That you might know him, that he might reveal sinful tendencies, and he might transform your life. So every time when I preach, I try to leave you with a very practical application, with a, a response that I would want to see, and my heart's desire. And I want you guys to come here. And I want you to give to the church and to people who are in need. I want you to love your enemies. I, like, I want you to do these things. But my heart's desire, the foundational thing, 
is that you would spend time in the Word of God. There is not a better gift you will give to yourself, to your family, to your employer, to your country, that you would take time to spend time with God every single day in His Word. Because the Word alone is inspired of God and inerrant and sufficiently clear that we might know it. Sufficient for life and faith and practice. So my challenge to you today is that you would do just that. That you don't wait till January 1 when everybody else is making resolutions, but right where you are today, that you would just commit yourself to the Lord, commit yourself to this body and say, I'm going to be a man of the word. Like out there, there's all sorts of teaching in this world. There's all sorts of things I could give myself to. I'm going to be a woman of the word. I'm going to be a man of the word. I'm going to be a student of the word of God. And I'm going to trust that what the Word says is true, and I'm going to allow it to be my guide. If you want to know how to be a parent, look at the Word of God. You want to know how to be a godly husband? Look into the Word of God or a godly wife or mother or whatever place you find yourself in. It is contained within the Word of God, which is sufficient for us. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be a people of the Word Lord, we know that men and women were martyred for translating the Bible. And men and, men and women have been martyred for standing upon your word and refusing to deny it or recant or, or whatever it might say. Father, I pray that we would be just as steadfast as men and women who have broad access to the Scriptures. May we not be disinterested or distracted, but may, may we see your word as inspired and inerrant and profitable in our lives that we might be shaped and molded into the people that you want us to be. I pray for every man and woman and child in this room today that we might be faithful to look into your word, to study, to seek you there. And I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.